Hey, we're talking about the summer psalms, you guys. So be in Psalm 103. Let me bring a message to you with the hopes that it will greatly encourage your hearts. Um, And this is what we've been saying week after week. This should be a season as we go into the summertime when we really enjoy life. I don't know about you, but uh, we were up uh, doing a wedding in Sacramento yesterday, and it was just beautiful. The sun is shining. It's triple digits up there as always. But there's something about this time of year that just blesses my heart. Um, I want to enjoy this time as much as possible, even, even when you're working and the sun is out. Um, there, there, there seems to be a refreshing element to this time of year. But what we've been saying every week is that it can be hard to enjoy life even this time of year because of the world we're in. How many of you would agree with that? With that? It's very hard even on our vacations to kind of let everything fall away and really enjoy life. And I want to tell you with absolute truth, with every ounce of me, I still believe that life can be lived like a song. And you cannot lose hope in that idea of living like this way, even when it's hard to live it like a song, a beautiful song. And I am fully convinced as well that this can be powerfully done through an ancient book of songs, the Psalms which is God's hymn book, as many call it. I believe if we can look at these psalms and experience these, these psalms, they hit every subject and they have the power to renew our minds and our spirits to give us an amazing life. And so we've said for, I don't know, the last uh, two or three weeks here that the Psalms work much like our latest iTunes album that we purchased. I just purchased uh, an album on iTunes and it reminds me of the Psalms because in this album I, I bought, I looked at all the songs, the titles, and I said, oh, well, this album speaks about love and it speaks about vengeance. It speaks about anger. It speaks about our world. It speaks about heaven. It speaks about hope. It's got, it's got all of these different uh, songs. And I said, man, I love these subjects. And here's why. I love these subjects they speak into my story they resonate with my life and so I want I want those songs to energize to open up my story and and help me I want them to ring true in my life so I don't feel alone so I buy this album well God's album has 150 songs and they speak to every element of our lives And for the very same reason that we buy our albums on iTunes or whatever it is, because songs speak into our stories and our situations, they draw us in, they give us hope, we can do the same thing with the book of Psalms. And it's critical, guys, especially in this world with all of the things that we face, with all of the news that's thrown at us every day, with all of our own heartaches that we go through every single day. It's critical that we understand that we become what we think and what we love. Do you get that? We're being shaped by what we think and what we love. With everything that's coming from the outside into my mind, which is taking that amazing 18-inch journey into my heart, I am becoming the message that's being sent, sent to me. You ever become kind of a cynical person for a season because a lot of hard stuff has come to you? So what we need to do is to take God's songs and allow the Holy Spirit to sing them into our minds until we believe them, and then we begin to feel them in our hearts and let God's music, God's words, God's psalms shape us. Now, I'm experiencing this in my own life as I'm going through the psalms, and I believe that if we meditate on the psalms, they too will begin to shape thought and emotion now think about that so if you're struggling with something like depression or you're struggling with the unknown like my family now is i need a song to be sung to me to renew my mind to to begin to attack all the doubt and all the frustration all the hopelessness whatever it may be the wrong message that's in my mind i need god's music to renew those thoughts and to begin to seep down into my emotions until i live them i believe them that's what we want And if you think of the condition of your life, think of the possibility of you if this book is that powerful, if God's Spirit is that powerful. Think of who God wants to make you with 150 songs on every uh, every emotion and subject you can imagine. So what we're going to do in light of Father's Day is we're going to put this album, Psalms, the 150 songs of God, we're going to put it on shuffle. And we're going to jump all the way to the 103rd Psalm 
And we're going to listen to God's song about being loved. And you're like, oh, man, this is Father's Day. We're not supposed to do that. You know, where's the David psalm about war, right, guys? Love, love songs. Oh, I grew up listening to my brother's 80s love music. Every time I hear Journey, I get nauseated. <laughs> Terrible stuff. And what was going on in the 80s? Well, this is a different type of love song that I think will help you greatly. Now, let me ask you this question here, and this is all in your notes. Why are we so consumed with being loved? Have you ever noticed that? Uh, the oldest person in the room to the youngest person in the room, male to female, whatever, whatever the sexual situation or gender situation is, whoever it is in the city, humans are consumed with being loved. And here's why we're consumed with being loved. It's because we know that if someone can love us, we can find a sense of significance. Think about that. I mean, that's why John Marius wants to be loved. I want to know that I mean something to someone. I want to know that I have a sense of significance. And when, when I know that someone is giving me affection, I feel that significance, and it's empowering to my life. But do you see the danger in this as well? In order to be loved by someone and find that significance that we all hunger for, it's very easy to make some dangerous decisions to be loved by another person, isn't it? I mean, how many of you guys have ever been in a really bad relationship with someone because you've been so desperate to feel significant and that one person has finally shown you that attention and you've dove, in, dove right into it? And pretty soon you're going, man, a lie, what did I get myself into? Now here's what I want you to get. One of the most critical truths that you can grasp in your Christian life right here. We can't be loved well enough by another person to truly satisfy the hunger in our hearts. Another human cannot sustain the weight of loving another human the way they need to be loved to feel significant and important because another human will fail another human. And that is why we enter these relationships, and it's not wrong to want to be loved, but when we put that type of pressure and weight on a spouse or a friend or a pastor or whoever it may be, a father or a mother, when we put that kind of weight on another human being, that you need to love me and love me perfectly so I, I continually feel significant, when that person fails, and they're inevitably going to fail because they can't carry that weight, that's when disaster strikes. How could you do this to me? I can do it to you because I'm a human and I'm broken. That love is designed to come from one who can't fail you in love. C.S. Lewis says it this way. Most people, if they had really learned to look into their own hearts, would know that they do want and want acutely something that cannot be had in this world. Probably earthly pleasures were never meant to satisfy it, but only to arouse it, to suggest the real thing. Here's what Lewis is saying. All of the emotions that you're having in your heart are actually there to get you to God because God alone can fulfill them without failing. And when we try to fulfill the emotions in the heart through another human being, that human being cannot carry the weight and pressure of doing it. No relationship can bear the weight of our heart's hunger to be loved. So, here's my question to you. You guys out there? Here's my question. What if we could free ourselves by taking the longing of the heart to be loved away from people and put it on God the Father? What if we could so experience Father love from God, a God who can never fail us or never let us down, that we could free people and have natural loving relationships without putting the pressure on people to never fail us. This is the song that I've been learning. One line at a time over the last 10 years, I want to know the perfect love of God that will sustain me forever, and I want to free those around me to not need their love, but to love them. And so I want to share with you this song. You ready? One point this morning for Father's Day. Uh, let's learn together how to sing the song of the Father's love. Isn't that something? Let's learn together how to sing the song of the Father's love. 
I'm going to go through just a few verses in Psalm 103 and take just a few lines of this song that they used to sing, this ancient song, and learn about the Father's love. Look at Psalm 103, verse 1. David opens this song by saying, Bless the Lord, O my soul. Now look at, look at who he's speaking to. Um, he's very good at talking to himself. Now you need, to, you need to keep that in mind. He says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Here's what he's saying. I need the Lord to do something to mind, spirit, soul, body. The Lord has got to do something to me throughout my entire being to so radically shake me into an experience that I cannot get on this earth. He says, bless his holy name. So here's what we got in verse 1. David's struggling, no doubt. And that's what I love about the transparency of the Psalms. Um, the writers of these songs just come right out like a really bad country song, and they tell you about every problem they have. But David is struggling, and so what he does, guys, and if you're struggling here, whether it's being loved or experiencing love, or maybe it's even with a father experience, or maybe it's just in general, here's what I want you to get. David's going through the same thing, and so here's what he does. He calls on his entire self to praise the Father. And here's why he's doing it. He realizes he needs something bigger. He needs something deeper that he's not finding in people and he's not finding in this earth. He needs an eternal love that as we sang this morning goes beyond even the cognitive. It, it's so amazing you can't even think through it. At some point you just fall down and embrace it. Look at Psalm 103 verse 2. He's speaking to himself. He's saying, David, bless the Lord. Oh my soul. The very deep parts, the very deepest fabric of my being. David, bless the Lord. And forget not all his benefits. And that's the key right there. David says, I've got to see the love of God in such a new way, in such a great picture, that I find such an experience with him. I don't have to find this experience in another human being for the rest of my life. And so the way that he finds, he, he experiences this love of God is by not forgetting all the benefits of God the Father in verse 2. So he starts speaking to his soul. He starts speaking to his mind and remembering how powerful God's love really is. Now I want you to, I want you to look at how I, I laid that out. He begins to speak to his mind and remember how powerful God's love really is. And this is the process of worship. Now look, at, look in your insert. In this moment, David puts the love of God into his mind until it awakens his heart. See, the heart is sleeping on the love of God. It's fallen asleep. The emotion has fallen asleep. And so David says, I've got to awaken the heart. I've got to awaken the, the emotion. I, and I got to do the same thing, you guys. I've got to awaken the emotion of my heart to be so blown away in God's love that I don't have to try to rip it from Jessica. Jessica, how come you didn't pay attention to me today? How come you didn't do this to me today? You know, Jessica, you're going out with so-and-so and hanging out with them. You know, I know that's your friend, but what about me? What about me or, or my daughter or whatever it may be or a church or, or whatever it may be? I need to free myself from that by experiencing and awakening this emotion in my heart towards God through remembering all the loving acts that God has done in my life so the Holy Spirit then awakens my heart to say, John, feel that right there. There's nothing like it in the world. Now free these humans around you and love them. So he puts the love of God in his mind. Oh, don't forget all the awesome things God has done in your life. And the Holy Spirit says, now, now heart, heart, wake up. It's not enough just to read the Bible. It's not enough just to hear sermons. That stuff about the love of God has to go in the ear gate. It has to go in the thought life. And then it has to go down to the heart. Thomas Goodwin, an old Puritan, said these words. A man is walking along a road hand in hand with his child. The boy knows that this man and his father. And that his father loves him. But suddenly the father stops picks up the child, lifts him into his arms, embraces him, kisses him, hugs him. 
And then he puts them down again. And they continue walking. It is a wonderful thing to walk along holding your father's hands. But it is an incomparable greater thing to have his arms wrapped around you. And that is the difference between knowing John 3.16 and having John 3.16 awaken the affections of love in your heart. Christianity is not about just taking in information. And it's only when the Father's love is understood and felt as a miracle, you guys, that it satisfies the heart. It's got to become a miracle. I mean, how many times do we hear John 3, 6, for, for God so loved the world, for God so loved the world, and you're at the wrestling match, and you're, at the, you're watching game seven, and this guy's got the John three sixteen sign. For God so loved the world, and you're like, yeah, for God so loved the world, that's it. But until that is a personal miracle in your life, it does not wake up the heart. You have got to see all that you were. And if you were, you, if you were saved, some of you were saved at like six years old, and you're like, I don't get the whole, uh, you know, really jacked up thing, and now you got saved out of all the craziness. I just never experienced that or whatever. Um, that's okay, because the miracle is that you did not have to go through what people like me went through. Until that salvific experience is a miracle to you by you looking to the past. See, we always say, oh, don't dwell on your past. Dwell on your past. Please dwell on your past in light of the gospel. Man, I think about all that I did to myself and all that I did to people. And I'm thinking to myself, man, how did God save this? Now my salvation is a miracle. Man, I was sitting doing this wedding and I was, yeah, the pastor's not supposed to cry in the wedding. And I'm sitting there trying to hold my composure and this couple who's our friends and, and they're standing right there and, and I'm praying. And I started thinking, while I'm praying, not, this is not a good situation that I'm in here. I'm thinking while I'm praying, like, God, how in the world am I doing a wedding right now? How am I marrying two believers together in holy matrimony when I came from the hood, you know? When I was so messed up. Like, people say, was your dad a pastor? No, my dad was like a bootlegger or something. He was not a pastor. I grew up without a father, and I'm sitting here doing this wedding, like tearing up, you know, and be, I can tell people are like, what's going on with this guy? But I'm thinking, like, how did I even get here? Now, I come to church on Sunday, and I'm like, I'm driving into San Francisco pastoring a church. This is a miracle. It's got to become a miracle. Psalm 103, verse 3, this is what David does. Who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit. There it is right there. Who redeems your life from the pit. So the way that God's love begins to take over his heart and free him is that he starts by remembering how bad things were. He dug his own grave that's what it means. He was in the pit. He could never escape on his own. I remember my brothers. This is what it's like when you're raised by brothers. My brothers were, their army, their 82nd Airborne, and before they went in, they were like training, apparently, when they were like 16, on me. And so they dug a pit one time. They dug a pit in our backyard. My mom would go to work, work two jobs, and so she would go to work, and he was on. Like, mom's gone, here we go. Let's get a little brother. And so a little bit like, oh, man, it's like Joseph. I just thought of that. Except I'm not as cool as Joseph. But anyway, they dug this pit. And one of my brothers was Joseph, so the story's a little backwards. But they dug this pit, and they put me in the pit. That's why I'm the way I am now. <laughs> and I remember trying to get out of this pit, and I was stuck. I could not climb up. I could not, I could not get up. As much as I tried to, to climb, the, the dirt would crumble. This is what David is saying. My life was like that. I got myself into such a fix that I could not get out. I remember being there after high school. You've got your own miracle salvation story, I hope. I remember being there uh, after high school. Um, I was asked to leave high school, politely. <laughs> and uh, I, they created almost a program just to get me out of there, to get me into a college and I had no business being there. But I remember no money, no help, no parental help. My brothers were gone. I didn't know what to do. 
I could not get out of a pit that I made for myself. And then somehow, some way, my wife gets me to go to a church and we get saved. And all of a sudden, this church starts rallying around us and investing in us. And our life is slowly being transformed through the body of Christ. And I look back now and I say, man, this is a miracle from God. God's love will only overwhelm your heart and be the only thing you ever want when your salvation is a miracle. So look back and look back and remember. And the staggering part of the miracle is that it would take the death of the Son to bring me out of the mess I made of my life, the cost of the the cross. I don't read the Gospels and read about the cross theologically. I read the Gospels and read about the cross theologically and I see Jesus bloody and dying for me. It's mine. And that's why David says he redeemed me from the pit. That slave market talk. It cost him something to bring me out of the slavery of sin. It cost Jesus' life. Man, when I begin to meditate on that, when I begin to, to awaken the heart, when, when that thought enters the brain and begins to awaken my heart because it's a miraculous story, then and then alone do I experience the greatest, most powerful love and all, all other human loves pale in comparison to this love. That is the moment when I look at my wife and I say, no, 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 I, let, let me love you. You don't know what I've just been through with God. This is amazing. And friends, let me preach the gospel to you. There is no awe if you think you've earned the Father's love. There is no awe if you think you've earned the Father's love. The awe comes when we realize that we did not earn it, we did not work for it, and we certainly did not deserve it, and yet it was lavished on us. To think you're earning the love of God And wondering why you're not feeling the amazing awe of his love? Are you in awe when you get a paycheck? You're like, boss, I worked so hard this week and I am absolutely blown away that you paid me. No, you're like, you better pay me. And that's the problem with some of us as Christian people is we think we're earning the love of God and so we say, yeah, God, you you owe me something here. But if you quit your job after you had stolen things from the company and told your boss off and that boss showed up at your door and he said, "I I know you've tried to wreck my company and I know you've tried to wreck me although I was so good to you. And you may never come back, but here's your paycheck. Man, that would hit you. And that's why the gospel is all of grace. That's why the love of God is not earned, but it's thrown on us because of what Jesus did. And what this is doing is it is turning every good thing in our lives into sovereign grace. And that overwhelms the heart. Paul says to the Corinthians who were so good and had earned everything, he says, what do you have that you did not receive? What do you have that God did not graciously give you? He goes on to say, if it is a gift of grace, then why do you boast as if you've earned it? C.H. Spurgeon would say in light of that verse, how can you boast if you're a debtor? So the beauty of not earning the love of God is for me to look at my past and look at my present condition and say, man, I fell, and yet God's love never fails. It's when that message goes into the mind that I awaken the emotions of the heart, and I feel the love of God. I don't know it, I feel it. And that is when I'm free of needing the love of humans. Now I can love them properly. And once you're in that state, you guys, you are free to give love away rather than be dependent on being loved by others. That is a powerful human right there. Psalm 103, verse 4, second part. I mean, this is ridiculous. Who crowns you? You know what I mean? Scandalous grace. Who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. You ought to underline those two words, steadfast love. 
Jesus Christ crowns me with steadfast love. He marks me with steadfast love. And that's the chesed of God. And what that literally means, I mean, we cannot even translate that in English. It's so amazing. The steadfast love of God is the hunting, faithful love of God. That love is hunting me down. It's relentless. You ever try to run from God? You ever try to run from the love of God? And one of the most fundamental mistakes we make is we, we always say this in the Christian circle, and I'll teach a little bit more on this down the road, that when you sin, you know, you kind of break the fellowship with God. You better be really careful right there, real careful, because we just saw in the scriptures that his love, when we are at our weakest point, is hunting us down. Psalm 23 and verse 6 works this out a little bit more. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, you know. It's like one of those dogs following you around, these stray dogs, like, I can't get rid of this dog, and I'm not going home until this dog stops following me because he's never going to leave my porch. Yeah, the goodness and mercy and love of God is following you around like that, and it's never going to stop. If you're in Christ, Father love. That's an amazing God. Let's listen to one more line of this song of the Father's love. How far does this love go? How about when we as God's children get really, really bad? How big is this love? Verse 13, Psalm 103. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. Compassion. Fear. Those who fear the Lord. The Lord shows compassion to. Now let me help you with the fear. Maybe you've had a bad experience with with a father and that doesn't sit well with you. Fear is an abuse here. Fear is an awestruckness. It's a father rescuing a child who knows he shouldn't have done it, but he's gone out too far again into the ocean while playing. He hasn't listened to dad, and he's drowning. And the child looks up as he's gasping for breaths of air, and he sees his father pulling him out of the water, and the child begins to cling to him. It's that fear, that awe of my dad's here. He's got me. You know what it's like when you're a little kid, and you're like, Dad, don't let go. Don't let go. Don't let go. That's what he's talking about. I remember uh, my brothers kind of raised me, and I remember being on a cliff face like in Daly City, and uh, we were climbing it. I don't, why? I don't know. There's a cliff. Let's climb down. You know, 300-foot cliff. It's just craziness. And so we're climbing down this thing, and my brother is below me, and I'm above him, and I'm climbing. I'm probably 10 years old. (laughs) And I fell. You want to know what happened? I lived. (laughs) I fell, and my brother, no joke, my brother catches me. (laughs) And I'm just sitting there like, please do not let go of me. And he just grabs a hold of me. He's a big dude. And, and I got the remnant of the size in the family. And so he just grabs me and he just pulls me in like this. And he says, hold on. And then, you know, I'm like, Ugh! you know, I'm like strangling him. And he just climbs back to the top. And the whole way, I'm grabbing a hold of this thing. I'm grabbing a hold of my brother, just going, don't let go. Don't let go. No, I'm not going to let go of you. This is the love of God. And when you start looking at your life like that, I've done so much. I've broken down so many times. I've, I've messed things up so many times. And yet this love will not let you go. It's when you experience that in the heart that you free human beings to just be human beings. Psalm 103, verse 14. I love this verse. It saved my neck many a time when I've thought about how God views me. For he knows our frame and he remembers that we are dust. Yes. You can go ahead and be as strong as you want to pretend you're strong. I'll do the dust thing. That's a metaphor for falling apart. 
I'm like, I'm like trying to super glue a sandcastle together. That's a metaphor for falling apart. We're falling apart. We're just human. And when God's children are falling apart, he loves you and loves you and hunts you with love. What a song. C.S. Lewis says, we delight to praise what we enjoy. We delight to praise what we enjoy because the joy is not complete until it's expressed. And that is why I've told you guys week after week that your greatest duty is to understand the Father's love and worship and express it until it awakens emotion in the heart. So I want to give you three ways to put the love of God into your mind so it awakens your heart. And they're right there in your insert on the bottom. And I think this would be a great thing to do during summer. Three things, you ready? Number one, learn the Father's love in the Word. You cannot take in enough of the Word of God. Learn the Father's love in the Word. Read the Word of God personally. Read the Gospels, go to the cross, read the Psalms, go to the, Flip, the book of Philippians and read it as if God is speaking to you. God, I want to know just how broken I am and how much you love me. I want to know the steadfast love of the Lord through the Word. I want to think on my past life and then I want you to speak to me through the Word of God so it goes into my mind and awakens my heart and I learn your love and experience your love and release all other people, the Word of God. Read it. Read it together. If you're a couple, read it together. Learn the Father's love in the Word, too. Learn the Father's love in the world. What do I mean by that? In nature, God reveals himself in multiple ways, one being the Scripture, two being creation. Do you realize that? Don't make stars stars. Don't see stars anymore. Stop seeing stars. See gifts from God. Go down to the ocean. All I need to do is get to the ocean and see the vastness and the power of one beach and realize that this is God at work. When you see flowers blooming or babies being born or, or all the miracles of the created order around you be in awe that it, all, it was all flung out there as God saying, hey, it's all yours to marvel and play in. Enjoy it, son. Enjoy it, daughter. Look around you, feel the, feel the warmth on your body as you walk out of this building and realize it is a gift of God's affection. He's saying, I got you. Learn the Father's love in the word. Learn the Father's love in the world. And three, learn the Father's love in worship. You cannot find a higher experience than worshiping Jesus Christ and God the Father through the community of the church. Be here. Don't miss this for the world. Unless you're out vacationing, looking at the ocean and worshiping God. And guys, I'm going to promise you because I, I experience it every week. You will awaken joy and pleasure in the Father's love that is so powerful. You will not need to look anywhere else. Let's pray. And this is our time to respond. This is our prayer response. God has spoken to us through his word. He's saying, know my love. Put it in your mind. Think of how far I've brought you. Look at the world I've given you. Let it awaken your heart. Experience my love so that you release the pursuit to find an all-satisfying love in human beings. Worship me. Let's spend some time praying to the Lord in response. music's going to play and I just ask you continue to pray to him there is no love like his love 
What an awesome gift to know that we cannot find it on this earth. But we can find it in Him. And if you're here and you're not a Christian, I know what that wandering journey is like. You can look in education, you can, you can look in work and career and success, you can, you can look in family, you can look for a, for a love and a spouse, and it's all good. But you keep coming up empty. There's still a depth in the heart that it won't reach. And I want to promise you from my own life, When I finally turned away from that pursuit and turned unto God and realized this is why Jesus Christ was crucified. So my sins would be forgiven and covered. This is why he rose from the dead. So I could be brought back into the love of God, into a relationship with an amazing father. And I pray if you've never been there, if you've never done this, where you sit this morning, the best way you know how, in the quietness of your heart, you would ask Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins and to save you. Do it now. Know this love. And for the rest of us who are saved, Friends, let this all-consuming, fiery, hunting, beautiful love be your daily experience. Continue praying, and we'll go into song.